My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Vanessa Neiman. Today's leadership quote comes from Cheryl Sandberg. It is the ultimate luxury to combine passion and contribution. It's also a very clear path to happiness. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Hey friends, it is episode 100. That's right, 100. I can't believe that I've made it this far and I've kept this up this long. But really, I'm more surprised and more humbled that you are still listening after 100 episodes. So props to you for sticking in there with me. Um, If you're just joining, uh, good luck going back and listening to all 100 episodes. Uh, It's a lot of content, a lot of great content. There are a few ums and ahs and sos and uhs uh, from yours truly, but I believe I am working on becoming a better interviewer, a better podcaster. So thanks for joining me on this journey. And again, uh, happy 100th episode. Be sure to check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 100. Leaderassistant.com slash 100. So thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoy this interview with my friend Vanessa Neiman. I couldn't think of a better assistant to interview for episode 100. And I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. And today I'm excited to speak with Vanessa Neiman. Hey, Vanessa, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, you're on the West Coast. Is that right? That's correct. I'm in San Diego in North County. So what was your very first job? And what skills did you take away from that job that you still use today in your assistant role? My very first job was when I was 14. I assumed my mom's house cleaning job and she had a side job because she was also a career assistant and a single mom. So she had to kind of do extra things to make ends meet. And um, she decided not to keep the weekend cleaning job. And I took it over for her and ported it over to Friday night. So I would take a bus into the neighboring town of Penasquitas when you were 14 and you could ride the bus by yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, it was cleaning the apartment of a pharmacist. And he was never there, so it wasn't creepy or anything. He, was, he worked long hours. And um, from that, he would leave me a list. And from that, I learned you know, to be on time, um, to be there when I said I was going to be there, to follow his list of instructions, and to do everything very thoroughly. Um, and then also the takeaway, if it's never a bad thing to do anything extra. And his apartment was small, but, you know, I'd maybe, if he just wanted me to launder his shirts, you know, I'd also fold them too or fold them nicely because I'd been doing my own laundry since I was seven. So I was pretty much, you know great at that. Mm -hmm. So, um, from there, um, it just progressed. You know, those are, those were good takeaways Hmm. even with, you know, just a a weekly job like that. Yeah. So then you said your mom was an assistant. My mom was an assistant. Yes. She, um, held roles with the local, uh, school district. She worked for a local tech company she was, well, went back when they still used the horrible S word, secretary. But, um, yes, yeah, she, I'm trying to think how long her career was. She probably worked as an assistant for about 15 years. Wow. So when you became an assistant, was it under the influence of, you know, just seeing her in that role and liking kind of how that went? Or was there a different path to uh, becoming an EA for you? I think, um, both, both of those apply when I was in, uh, college, I pretty much put myself through. So I had to figure out a way to make money 
and amortize it to where I'd have enough to pay for each subsequent semester. So I started out um, in doing that in clothing retail after going from the cleaning job to babysitting to McDonald's. And then when I was 17, I took, took a job in clothing retail and did various clothing or toy retail for about three years. Um, didn't love that after a while. Uh, it was great at learning how to work with the public and customer service and all that. But um, I need steadier hours and to get off my feet. So um, I decided like, hey, why not? Why don't I look for something at my school? That would be really helpful and um, wouldn't have to commute. So uh, back when the job board was actually, you know, a bulletin board with things tacked to it. I found student assistant job in the department that supported or in the office that supported the art department and consumer family studies, which was like, um, oh, the culinary school at the university and and all that. So I was a student assistant to the assistant of the department center office. I know it's a long thing. (laughs) And I don't think I would have thought about that if my mom hadn't said, hey, you know, why don't you see if there's some kind of assistant work you can do? Because that is steady and and, um, you know, it's it's interesting and and you'll be there on campus. Hmm. And I don't think I would have thought of it if she also hadn't been an assistant herself. Yeah. So when did you kind of that was that you said that was at the school? That was at the school, yes. So when did you move into kind of the corporate world as an assistant? I moved into the corporate world uh, right after college. So when I was in my early 20s, and um, it's funny to, um, and it'll prob- this will probably touch on another question, but um, I was looking for something in my field that I had studied in school, which was art. But um, back then, I was not as I am now. I was very, um, I'm more extroverted, introvert now. Back then, I was pretty introverted, introvert. So um, being an artist and having to sell myself and figure out what that was going to look like, I just, I tanked badly. (laughs) So I I needed to support myself right out of school. So um, I thought, well, I was an assistant in school and I like that you know, just fine. So I'm going to look for assistant work that will also pull in some of my, um, the creativity, you know, the creative aspects that I studied in college. So I found a job with a mortgage banking company that needed a communications administrative assistant. And that was supporting their media relations department. And it was, it was really fun. Um, just uh, helping write press relief releases and distribute them when back when you had to send a hundred different faxes <laughs> <laughs> over a monstrous fax machine, um, where you had to call newspapers. Uh, you know, I'm not going to date myself, but anyone can figure out from when I graduated college to where I am now how old I am. But I'm not going to say it. Either. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was. That was my first entry into the corporate world. I was with that job for um, a couple of years and then just uh, developed from there. But it was funny, too, because I I didn't fully embrace that that was going to become my career for quite a long time to come. It was a make do, you know, until I can um, develop out of it, because I think back then, or maybe later on, shortly after, there were TV shows like Melrose Place where, you know, Courtney Thorne Smith had a role as a receptionist as her entry level job out of college. And then she got, you know, high powered uh, ad assistant or something, you know, or, or ad person at her agency and you know, evolved out of that. Like, I'm going to do that. You know, this is just, this is just a, a placeholder. And, um, I won't say I didn't take it seriously, but I, um, I didn't respect it as a profession that I wanted to stay with for, for quite a long time to come. Hmm. So then you've kind of had, um, a pretty extensive career as an EA and then a senior, senior level EA. Yes. Um, yes. and then recently you made a transition to a new company. Tell us a little bit about kind of 
that um, like what you've learned, what you learned from the process and maybe, you know, you're, I'm hoping that you're not sending a hundred faxes anymore. Um, no. <laughs> 2019, but yeah. like what, what's something that you learned in that process of just trying to find a new job or, or maybe you, maybe it found you. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, once I did respect the role, I decided I wanted to keep developing, keep growing, um, and keep growing into roles with successively more responsibility because, um, always great respect for individuals who can keep the same role for many, many years or decades at a company. But I knew that wasn't going to be me because I like to just keep developing, even though I'm out of college, you know, that, uh, I was always just really voraciously wanting to learn. And I applied that to my profession also. So that was my career trajectory throughout. And eventually I set myself the goal of, well, I want to get to the point where I'm, and no offense to middle management anywhere where, okay, I've learned how to support middle management. I want to support a senior VP. And then from there, I want to get into the C-suite. And then from there, I want to support a CEO and um, have just been setting myself those milestones along the way. And now about 20 seven years in, I guess, <laughs> I've, I've reached that. So um, at my last organization, um, and just on a sidebar, culture is so important, and it's a real buzzword nowadays because I'm all over LinkedIn and, you know, other apps and platforms and things. And, um, and I didn't really know what I didn't know back in the day. Um, occasionally I would leave jobs. It just didn't feel right. They just didn't fit me or my dynamic, but, um, just didn't have the nomenclature for it. You know, I would just think, well, this didn't fit, but I'm going to, I'm going to try this instead. And, and it was culture usually more often than not. Um, not a specific manager, but culture. So in the last place, I pretty much knew, and that's on me, my first week there, uh, that it was a little off from what I would prefer. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, they did not have a deep well of, oh, and I hope this isn't too scathing, but of respect or understanding of the assistant role in any parlance like there was no leveling there was no mapping there was no trajectory um long ago when the company first came into being about 40 years ago it, i think it was a secretary pool and that anybody who was called an assistant of any kind anyone could randomly come up to you and ask you to do any random thing ever with no structure or whatever so 40 years on that culture was still very much in place. And I was a little bit shocked and I am not the introvert introvert anymore by any means. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been doing this a long time. So it's not like I'm, you know, the know all I Ching, but I kind of know what works and what should be in place. And I love a process. And if there are no processes or infrastructure or a cohesive culture, then that's pretty glaringly obvious from the beginning. So that, that was there, but, um, like, well, I don't like to just come in and then leave. I, mm -hmm. I like to give things a year or two cause I feel like you can really sit in it and do what you can do without losing your heart or your mind in the process and, um, you know, add your value and then figure out, is this really going to work for me? So my first seven months were for, um, someone <laughs> we just, it's not that we had animosity or anything that, um, specific. I truly don't think he had ever had an assistant and knew how to be assisted. And he was in a little bit over his head with his role, I felt. So, um, he would only speak to me pretty much when I almost physically had to ankle tackle him when I had questions, he spoke to me six times in seven months. Wow. Yeah. And, um, kept adding people on to my slate. So I had three people 
two, including him, that were full time, just 100 percent, just crazy, busy meetings, travel expenses. And then four more that were kind of, you know, just happenstance here and there. And I hated it because that was um, not really what I understood the role to be. I didn't like the lack of communication or direction. So I was just kind of biding my time to see if another role would open up or um, I was starting to just, you know, put my feelers out. And lo and behold, another role opened up the one that I just exited from and um, much better fit. It was for the chief marketing officer. So C-suite, um, what I wanted. So I like to be where the decisions are being made. I don't like to be several levels away from it. That's just my voraciousness. I like to know what's going on behind the scenes and why. And when you're in the C-suite, you're right there where it's happening. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, that was that was great in the offset. Um, we very much clicked. And again, the culture and the infrastructure was still lacking. And he was very much aware of that. But our partnership was a partnership. And it was a complete opposite of the previous role. And we just got along swimmingly and we knew our mandates and just went for it. Um, got a little weird when senior management changed in the last six months and that partnership began to crumble and in ways that I just did not, could not fathom or understand because there were really no explanations for it. So, um, it just got weird Hmm. and, um, and strangely, you know, the universe kind of gives you what you need when you need it because that's happened to me on more than one occasion. I, a recruiter reached out to me during the beginning of this crumbly, weird era and um, for the job that I now have. And I just couldn't pass it up because uh, the role, the title, um, what I understood it to be, the compensation was amazing because San Diego really struggles with, with good compensation for EAs. That's a topic for another show. Mm. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I like, I can't not go for this. I just don't like to turn down opportunities and be regretful later. Hmm. So I went for it. And during the whole recruitment course, um, you know, it just got really weirder and I'm really glad that I had, that I had taken this opportunity. So probably very long and rambling answer, but, um, but also I, I, I hit one of my milestones or I'm, you know, beginning to hit it because I, I have supported a CFO before and a CAO and that's lovely because I can bring my, you know, experience to that, but I've only done backup to a CEO and now I get to support the CEO. Hmm. Awesome. So that's exciting. Yeah. I hit, I hit one of my, my wish list items. Yeah. You know, I've only, uh, I've only, well, 10 of the 12 and a half years that I've been an assistant, I've been, uh, or almost 10, maybe nine years, I've been supporting the CEO, basically. So it's, I don't know that if I, I could ever go back. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, it's, um, and I guess doing it the more, I don't want to, you know, old fashioned, that's, there's a better word, I'm sure. But from just doing that long trajectory. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> It's nice to have had that stone gathering the moss of experience, weird analogy. But um, but nowadays it isn't unusual for people to come from, you know, their education and they have all these great specific courses now for, you know, people that want to be assistants where you don't have to go to a traditional, you know, academic college. You can go to a course and come out and support C-suite. And I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, more power to it. Or I have a friend who, um, she kind of did a move from being a project manager into being C-suite where she hadn't really done a lot of assistance, but that was a great trajectory going from project manager into the C-suite because you are a project manager. So, yeah, you know, I was a admin assistant then I was a, basically an EA for couple times and then I was a project manager right before I leaped into my EA to CEO role um haven't turned back so 
Yeah, I know. And I'm sure you found your project management experience really helpful. Yeah, it's one of the roles that I've I've suggested to executives that if they're having a hard mm-hmm. time finding an assistant, look for some project managers and there, you might find a really good EA um, in that bucket. I completely agree. I, I think it's um, I think it's great that there's so much more imagination and flexibility and malleability for those that understand the role and how they want to recruit for the role. Yeah, that's that's a good sea change. I like it. it. Yeah. So you talked a lot about how you just love learning and you've always been just kind of a lifelong learner. So how do you recommend assistants um, can grow their skills and also develop new skills? Um, to grow your skills, I mean, it, it just depends on how you are personally. Because again, I just, I can't not be in a learning mode. Um, and that can be anything from Googling something that I just saw fly by me on TV to, hey, I, um, I'm working for marketing. And there's a PR course being given by our local community college online. So I think it would be helpful if I just took that and I kind of know what people are talking about more. And um, so the initiative, having the initiative, having the flexibility, just having that hunger to just keep adding to your toolkit. And it can be courses. It can be conference systems. Uh, it can be all these great books and podcasts such as yours. Um, LinkedIn has just wonderful articles on it. Uh, just identifying what you want to learn and then just like just flying squirrel it. Just go for it. Just eat it all up because um, we are hubs. We are information hubs in these roles. And um you just really need to soak all that knowledge up because you never know where you're going to have to pull a tool out of your tool belt and say, oh, yeah, I took a course in that. Yeah, why don't I just, you know, da da mm-hmm. and, and people are like, oh, really? What? Which, you know, at this spicier stage in my personality, um, when you get the, oh, you went to college? Like, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> because sometimes in the more elitist cultures that I've worked for, they think that this job is, um, because you couldn't do anything else. And, uh, no, that's, that's not, that's not accurate. We're very intelligent. So, um, you got the job because you were the only one that could do all of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I must've impressed, you know, the last goodness, how knows many 10 people that I interviewed with over the course of my career, because, um, yeah, because I went to college and I add everything to my LinkedIn, you know, every course I've taken in technical communication because it sounded fun and it really helped me structure presentations or help structure them. Um, I was also a minor in English and creative writing. So there's awesome. that. I like words <laughs> and and shaping them and shaping them to your audience. That's just really helpful. So yeah, if you want to learn, you want to be the best assistant you can be, then just get out there and connect and learn and grow in whatever manner you feel would fit. Yeah. Awesome. So what about, let's talk a little bit about the role. So how can assistants own the role in a way that shows, um, those that that work around them, that they're passionate and self-motivated? Owning the role is key. I think I let the role own me in the earlier arc of my career because you're young and you don't know what you don't know. And I used to be easily intimidated, but (laughs) not anymore. Um, and, And you establish that with the more savvy manager. I don't like to use the word boss. I'll say executive or manager. Um, on you work that out first. What is, what is the understanding of my role? And then um, you just keep building your your little fence around that. You just keep protecting it and you keep reiterating it and you own it and you're confident in it nicely. Not, oh, that's not in my job description. Oh, no, I don't do that. It's more um, 
well, uh, you know, I support person A and as such, I um, am here to protect their time and to make sure everything is as strategically placed as possible with them. So if someone is trying to hit me with random stuff that they could do or anyone could do, like, you know, that is not something that's going to strategically um, matter to my manager. So, um, you know, I, I, I do say no to yeah. things like that. And if I'm not sure, then I ask. And most of the time, my instincts are correct. And it's, it's a no, I'm sorry, you can own that yourself. Or, um, but gone are the days when I was a department assistant, you had to say yes to everything. It's a great learning mode. But now I know what I should know. And um, you just have to keep, you know, nicely drawing, drawing that line to protect. And it's not about being poopy or, you know, lazy or anything like that. It's no, that does not serve the needs of my manager. So no, thank you. Um, and I had to do that a lot at the last place because of the lack of culture. Uh, I had to just keep redefining what it was that I was there to do. Hmm. And um, some people, you know, were like, oh, at first, thing, well, mm, you being offended is not my problem. I own my <laughs> role and you don't understand what it is. It's it was the there was a, definitely a mindset for a while until I kind of kept doing just the, the water torture drip on people until they understood that because you think my role is one thing is not actually what my role is. I know what my role is and I'm going to deliver that back to you in the most professional way possible. So let's flip over to the executive side for a second. What's one tip that you would give executives to help them get more out of their assistants, but really to help their assistants own the role as well? I would say with executives, please be a partner in your own support. And by that, I mean, stay out of your calendar and let, you know, your assistant be your calendar, but also have a sense of where your time is placed because there's nothing worse than, um, than a manager like, Oh yeah, Vanessa, um, I told someone, so I'd see him tomorrow at da, 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 da. Hey, um, you're on vacation tomorrow <laughs> in like, you know, San Francisco. Oh, okay. You know, just kind of have a broad sense of where your time is placed and then I'll handle the minutia. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought on that one. But um, and then like hearkening back to what I said before, um, have those conversations early with your assistant on how you're going to partner together and partner um, with the assistant. You can have that gut sinking feeling in the early days, regardless of how great your interviewing process was. Are you working with each other or are you working for your executive? Because then you have to, you know, is it one-sided or is it two-way? Is there room for dissension? Is there room for suggestion or recommendation? Or are you a functionary? And um, that's how I feel executives can um, get the most out of their assistant by determining what the partnership will be. Mm-hmm. And then redefining it, you have to have open communication all the time. Even if it's, you know, you're chasing them out to their car or across the building to the restroom or whatever. Yeah, I do that a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I I think we all do. (laughs) It's funny. So five minutes. Yeah, (laughs) I'll take it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So what about networking with other assistants? Do you have any tips or thoughts on uh, networking? Um, in past roles, networking really mostly just entailed, and this is before the internet just got so marvelous and lovely, but, um, just email, you know, finding out who your, your EA constituents were and just, um, connecting with them and trying to go, you know, establish some sort of uh, structure if there wasn't of a monthly dinner, or maybe you hit them up to go to the coffee house, you know, nearby, or if you have one actually, on your campus and things of that nature, just to connect, you know, we're all in the same boat together and, and have lunch and learn some things. Um, that's actually at some places was discouraged, which is very saddening. So, um, didn't stay long at those places. 
Uh, nowadays, you can connect across LinkedIn, you can connect across Facebook, you can connect um, by going to conferences and such. And um, I've made some great contacts that have, have recently, including yourself, that have really opened my eyes to what could be. And um, I, for my next round, not just for learning something, but now I want to execute something, I would like to start a network for EAs in San Diego because I feel like we really need it. San Diego's always been a little bit of a strange place to be in EA, and I, I'm not sure why. I have some ideas to why, but I mentioned compensation's an issue, respect for the role is an issue, um, and support is an issue of each other. So I think that would be really nice to start opening that dialogue. And I, I really like what Adele Selby and Mina Italiano are doing over in Australia. So I'm going to reach out to them yeah. soon and, um, and see if I can pick their brains. Uh, you know, I just thought of this. The uh, do you know Jess Lindgren? The did you hear the interview that I, I had with her? I just listened to that, and I like she's in San Diego, so I'm going to hit her up too. And um, Melissa Peoples, I met her at a couple conferences that I attended, and she's going to be coming through San Diego soon. And she's like my new EA guru BFF, so we're gonna figure out some stuff together. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's been a, a good, like a weird year with that last place, but a really good year for other things for connecting. So I can't complain. That's great. So what in your mind makes an assistant a leader? An assistant is a leader by um, going back to what we were talking about, about owning your role uh, and being confident in that ownership. And you you do lead, you are the face of your manager. Sometimes you're the face of your department or even organization, depending on high, how high up you go. And, um, people look to you for things. So to me, that's a leader. You are co-leading with your manager executive, um, just by being that knowledge hub and being that face and, um, you know, having the access to, the calendar and the minutia that, um, other people may not have. So to me, that is, um, leadership, even though, um, others may not see it that way. It definitely is. It's hmm. awesome. So Vanessa, thanks so much for taking time and share your story and, uh, your tips and wisdom, uh, for my listeners. Is there something that we can do to support what you're up to and where can we find you online? Online, um, I <laughs> I love social media. It's probably the art and the uh, the writer in me. Yeah. I like to connect. I like to connect, and I like to read what other people are saying. And eventually, I'm going to write my own articles besides nice. sharing other people. So there's there's something too. I'm in my. I haven't evolved into my final form yet, so I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter, and. Um, probably mostly on LinkedIn and Instagram right now. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook or Twitter. Twitter's mostly my news amalgamation app. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't tweet a lot unless I'm pushing something through from Instagram that just toggles through, which is easy. Um, how others can support me is, uh, I guess just, you know, watch and see what I do next. I, um, I would love someday to be, you know, like Phoenix Norman, whose book is on my night table waiting to be read or Peggy Grande or, you know, someone that has, um, I can consolidate, you know, my, I guess, wisdom, as you call it. Thank you. Um, for others to read. I truly never thought I would have this platform back in the day. And I think it's really great that you and others like you are starting to make these connections. So I guess just watch and see what I do next and see if you want to, you know, be a part of that. Awesome. Well, I'll share all those links in the show notes so that people can like, comment, follow, connect, you know, all that fun stuff and uh, keep up with what you're doing. And uh, yeah, really appreciate taking the time out of your day. Enjoy your San Diego evening. Thank and, you. <laughs> 
we'll, our uh, 80 degree evening. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'll get to uh, visit in the middle of in the dead of winter. <laughs> You're always welcome. Just come on by. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Vanessa. And thank you for listening. That's a wrap for episode 100. Check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 100. Please review on Apple Podcasts. Go bullos.com.